What's up, desktopers? Xavier Wills here for Desktop Bodybuilding, and we are back for another episode of Bodybuilding University. And today I'm joined by Stanimal, Stan DeLondre, IFB Pro, and Ron Harris, formerly of Muscular Development, Bodybuilding Reporter and Analyst. Ron, how you doing? I'm good, man. Xavier, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Yeah. That's good. Trying to build That's good. Trying to build up Ron, Ron Harris Muscle YouTube. I told you I've had that channel for 18 years, but I did jack shit with it for about 17.8 years. So. <laughs> do you ever do you ever wish now that when you you were with MD that you actually put some content out on there to keep it like to get a bit of a following and stuff, or do you just go? Well, you know, my wife always said MD is not gonna last forever, nothing lasts forever. Like, shut up, you know, what do you know? It'll last forever. But yeah, I, I kind of wish, but you know, better late than never. And um yeah, I'm doing it. It's it's rough. It's tough. It's tough. You we got great. I have so much competition. Guys like you are killing it, you know. But I'm I'm uh, inspired. I'm motivated. But uh, I'm not leaving. I'm 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 not ready to leave the business quite yet. I still got a few good years left in me. For sure. Mm -hmm. And everyone, uh, I'll put the link in the description below as well. So go over, subscribe, and check out Ron Harris's videos over there. But um, what else has been happening, Ron? I know we were talking before. You mentioned about the hair transplant plant and everything you had done. And how's how's the uh, well, I don't know if you call it the recovery from that. How's that all going? Oh, well, I mean, I had a quad tear um, last, oh, yeah, end of course, last August. Course. Yeah, so that I'm trying to get my leg size and strength back. I'm not worried about having giant quads ever again, but I'd still like to get them close to where they were. Uh, so that's a process. The hair thing, it's starting not to look as bad. This is what they call the ugly duckling phase, which is about the first three to four months after the transplant. Uh, like I said, before we start recording, Stan's got a beautiful head. If I had a head like that, I would have just let it go. Yeah. But <laughs> man, my, head's, I got, I got, my head's all lumpy and misshapen. And yeah, but uh, it takes about a year for the full result, believe it or not. Yeah, that's that's crazy. I, I know Sebum, I don't know what the, the rules are, but Sebum was cutting it sh quite short all the time. And I know Ian mm -hmm. left his. And I, I was wondering, is there like, is there risks to doing that? Because I would think there sort of was. Well, you're not supposed to, cut the the uh, donor or the recipient area at all for for a few months and then even then for the first year they say use scissors no no clippers uh, but yeah. i get what he's doing because this hair like this was my thick normal hair this is growing my wife cut it for me the other day with clippers because it was starting to get all bushy on the side and it looks stupid because it's all you know thin and sparse here but it's funny i went to the same place that they went to not because they went to my i had booked my trip before Chris and Ian went there and approach Greg Doucette went to the same place. It's uh, just funny. This is, there's like, I think there's about a hundred different places in Turkey that do that. In Istanbul. Oh, for real. It's all they do is hair, is hair and teeth, hair and teeth. It's like a factory over there. It, yeah. Isn't it? I, I don't know how they do it so much. I, I know it's not like, obviously like cheap. It's not like you're paying, you know, 500 bucks to go get it done, but for the process compared to what I've heard, it costs elsewhere. How do the, uh, like, I don't understand how they do it so much cheaper there. Is it just the economy factor or what? Yeah, I know. Like, even the food was cheaper there, I've noticed. So the U.S. dollar grows further there. But I think just in general, in the U.S., all medical procedures and the whole medical industry is so overpriced and inflated with with uh, with what they charge for everything. So just to give you an idea, I don't care if I tell what they're... It cost me, it cost me about six grand for this in Istanbul. In the U.S., can't get it any cheaper at a at a nice place, a, a reputable place for anything less than twenty thousand, and the better places are like thirty thousand. So, it, it just made sense. It's like I'd never wanted to go to Turkey in my life. No offense to the Turkish people, wonderful people, but it's not like that was like, oh boy, I can't wait to go to Turkey someday. But man, I I couldn't turn that down. It's it's about beautiful, a quarter of the, the price. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did the tour one day. Yeah, Istanbul is a nice, it's a very old city, as I'm sure you know. Some cool shit from the old Roman Empire days and everything. Yeah, that'd be cool. Mosques. I used yeah. to go there every year for like eight years. Oh, really? Yeah. For what? I was dating a girl who was half Turkish. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, it, was, it was nice there. Yeah. Yeah. Good weather, yeah, wind, warmer wind, windy, so it's, it's very like tolerable. Beaches are beautiful, like sun, mm. all that. Like, yeah. Oh, really? I don't think of but, Turkey and think of beaches like for some yeah, reason. I didn't see a beach where I was. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's funny, the hotel was in Asia and uh, the the hospital like six miles away where they did the procedure was in Europe. 
So half of Istanbul is in Europe and half of it's in Asia. For real. I didn't yeah. even know, I didn't yeah. know that. I didn't I didn't know well, that either. A bridge. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's wild. That's wild. Yeah. That's, wild. Yeah. that's crazy. Um but I was Ron, curious about um sorry. I was yes, wondering Dan. if you tried different things before doing the hair transplant. Have you tried other stuff before? Or? Yeah, I was doing um I had from the the company called Hims, I had a topical thing that was half an asteroid, half uh, minoxidil. I was doing that for a good year. Didn't see any any improvement at all. And even before that, yeah. I had tried like a minoxidil foam for for a good six, eight months. Didn't see any change at all. So you haven't tried anything like PRP or exosomes? I've done the PRP now because they recommend after the transplant, you do it a few a few sessions. But no, I had never tried that prior. Exosomes are supposedly great also for hair loss. Like people yeah. recover their, their vision, even their sights. They get, you know, they improve their, because wow. they people get in their hair, you have to inject, inject the exosomes in the in the fog. And then with the blood flow, it, it rushes to the eyes and improve the, uh, the vision too. Oh, wow. I had no idea. But uh, the PRP, I had it done, a, a nurse practitioner did it. So they take your blood and they spin it around a centrifuge. And then yeah. I saw the syringe and the, the plasma is actually like a, almost looks like trend. It's like a pale yellow. <laughs> like, oh, wow. <laughs> That's a sacred. Cool. <laughs> no, and I didn't lose my hair from steroids. Uh, it was I have I have four brothers. We all have the same male pattern, same bald spot here, the same recession here. My younger brothers actually got had less hair than I had, so it wasn't the gear. I I felt like I had supreme confidence, but I'd never lose my hair because when I was younger and I go get haircuts, the hairdresser would always say, "Oh, your hair's so thick, your hair's so thick," but then I eventually realized at some age it's they stopped saying that. And then I know <laughs> and I always had a really good hairline and I had a, a barber that was cutting my hair back a little bit on one side. And like, this is back when everyone was having like a line cutting their hair and stuff. And I had that done. It was getting cut back a bit. And then when I was like, Oh, we'll, we'll grow it back down a bit. And when it grew back down, it just wasn't as thick in that spot. And I'm like, Oh shit. <laughs> I'm like, I guess that's what happens when you're above 30, like things start to fade. But yeah. But the, I do know it's funny because the as I started to lose my hair more and more, I I got a lot more conscious of how much hair old some older guys had, and I <laughs> I couldn't understand. Some of them had like a mop on their head. I couldn't understand it. Like there's a guy at my gym, he's got to be um if not seventy, he's got to be close to it. He's got the thickest hair everywhere, a hairline down to here, no bald spot, just like a big big rug of hair, and it, it looks. Mm -hmm. I've gone up close. It's real. I, think I, I actually I asked him one time I said I don't want to be I don't want to be a rude or offensive but I'm just curious because I'm losing my hair is that is that your real hair he goes yeah yeah that's my hair god bless you a lot of people put the, those wigs too it's very like close to like, yeah. you can't really tell oh who is doing yeah. that Stan we, yeah. we talked about this on the podcast once oh Mac Truck ah Mac Truck yeah Mac Truck he did yeah he did that a thought... bunch of times I thought it we would. Oh no, we was we were speculating about someone doing it. I think because then oh, they all of a sudden had hair really quick. <laughs> they had like a hair full of hair. <laughs> who was that? I can't even remember now. But yeah, I remember that. You're like maybe you did that, and I was like, oh yeah. But um, oh, yeah, they they look inc incredibly real. I need to but, move my car for a second. I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, you go for it. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Yeah, I, I wanted to um. <laughs> I wanted to actually give a big shout out. Um, I'll just share my screen. Uh, wherever I'm still getting used to using Zoom because I was on StreamYard for quite a while. This is by um, Crown Custom Belts, uh, Chris. Yeah, I saw that post. I saw that post here. It came out really nice. Yeah, he, he made this for me and it's, it's got the desktop bodybuilding on the inside with the, the date I did put my first video up. I'm a front wow. family over everything, which is obviously, you know, um, yeah. something that sort of I live by and then got uh, I've got my son's and my daughter's names on the back and oh. then the family name as well so Kylo and Sophia and obviously blue for boy and then pink for girl nice. I know that's controversial these days Ron oh, <laughs> not to me, boys no, and no. pink for girls <laughs> Dude, I'm 54 it's uh, I'm not I'm not woke and I'm not subscribing to all this nonsense I Go don't have, I don't have to learn 35 different pronouns sorry yeah. <laughs> I, I came out great yeah you know in the U.S. Everyone goes to this guy Cardillo, who's in Massachusetts here in the Boston area. Steve Cardillo, yeah, like uh, like Jose Raymond, a good friend of mine. He has like a hundred, a hundred belts that Steve's made for him over the years. It's a ridiculous yeah. collection. And I That's think nice. the, uh, 
the guys that make the high quality stuff, it's worth it's worth the investment because it's one of those things that a weight a good weight belt they last is forever. Like I, I've had one decent one before, and it it lasted a really really long time. But until until it got stolen or lost or something. Oh man, I want to I want to show you mine. <laughs> oh yeah, you get you get yours. I have to but, disconnect um, back for a sec. No, that's all good. But yeah, I just want to give a massive shout out to Chris because like the fact that he reached out. Uh, go give him a follow. I'll put the link to his uh, IG page in the description below. But this guy is incredibly kind, right. incredibly gracious. Yeah. So uh, making this for uh, me. So this was uh, a Cardillo belt that he made for me. They gave it to me. They gave it to me at the Boston Pro. So it was, uh, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it was like two pictures that they had. Uh, I think Jose helped him pick out the pictures. Yeah, that's so was, cool. Uh, so I got that in spring of 2022, and MD was no more after November 2023. But I'll always have this belt. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. There's still that. Me. There's still that nostalgia with um, MD, and when I look back at like the old, all the old flexes, it's it is really when you think about it. And I've thought about it a lot because when I got into bodybuilding, you had Gold's yeah. Gym. You had all those things. I'm like, well, oh, when I get to go to America and, and have the full bodybuilding experience, I'll go to Gold's Venice. And I was so excited about it. And now it's just not that. And it's like adjusting to this whole different way of bodybuilding being iconic, I guess, in a way. It's sort of it's sort of weird. But yeah, so I sort of miss all those sort of iconic things like the magazines and all that sort of stuff. And I feel like we're, we were craving all the bodybuilding content back in the day, and now we're so over overexposed to it. It's like we can be so selective about what we watch and consume in terms of bodybuilding, which is good. But in some ways, it's like, I don't know. I remember when those Kai Green videos came out on MD back in the day. I remember that series. Yeah. That one was yeah. huge. Uh -huh. I remember yeah. I was yeah. hanging out to watch the next one. Like I was like, I cannot wait to watch it. So I was going to the MD site, refreshing it. You know, no one goes to a website and refreshes for some content coming out these days, unless it's like a Nike shoe drop or something like that. And mm -hmm. that was uh, Dave Pulsinello's brother Mike did those videos. He he did excellent yeah. work. And then um, Dave Burlo, Burle, Dave Burle, Burle. Out in Venice. He did a series with Jay Cutler right around the same time. I think it was. That was just amazing. It's like a, mm -hmm. I think it was I don't know if it was called a Jay in the Life or whatever it was. It was like it was some of the best. Life, yeah. Yeah, they were awesome videos. I I, yeah. I I love those videos. Yeah, and that was like the early days of bodybuilding media. And then you had, I remember the first bodybuilding podcast was obviously Dan Solomon and Bob Ciccarello. I, I remember hearing that and that was like, yeah, that was a, that was a refresh bodybuilding.com sort of thing as well. And then obviously when it went to MD, followed that. And then, you know, all of that. And then it's, yeah, it's, it's so crazy when you think back about how much the industry has even changed in, in terms of divisions we've got now. Because I got into it mm. early days when it was, I think it was bodybuilding. I think figure was new. I think fitness was in there and women's bodybuilding. I think that was it. I think, yeah, I think I fitness was the first division added after bodybuilding, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Then figure, then what was it after that? Yeah, but I, I obviously got into it when it was just bodybuilding. So I used to go, we'd go to shows and all, if you were competing, you were a bodybuilder. If you were a man or a woman, there was two divisions, men's bodybuilding, women's bodybuilding. I remember in the late eighties, even the early nineties, teenage classes would have at a regional <laughs> or local show, 20, 30, sometimes 40 teenagers competing. There weren't that many masters back then. It's funny because now it's all masters because everyone got older and the mm -hmm. teenagers, they don't, they don't do it anymore. But we, we would have shows that would go till, I don't Geez, sometimes like 11 or 12 at night because there'd be like 300 competitors at like a regional show and it was just bodybuilding nothing else good old mm. days yeah I, I it's funny i miss the teenage bodybuilding because that's where i started well i, I mm. first competed when i five days after i turned 17 i think it was so i was only oh. just turned 17 competed like yeah i was skinny as hell and all that but when you're that age and competing it's so exciting like so incredibly oh, yeah. exciting and I was, it, you, you're always like, oh, talking about this guy, oh, this guy's doing it. And you're so excited to get up on stage. And now I've heard, do they even have teenage bodybuilding anymore? What? They try. I mean, they have, like, I've been to shows where they, on the poster, it'll say teenage bodybuilding, but then no one shows up to compete in that division. A lot of the times there's like, no one shows up to do the women's bodybuilding anymore. 
But you know, it's funny. I remember because back in my when, when I was doing teenage shows, there was no social media. Obviously, we would just hear rumors about kids from other gyms. You didn't know what they. You just hear, oh, there's this kid. He's huge. He's this. He's that. He's got these arms. He's got these legs. And you'd have to wait till you actually went to the show to see what this kid looked like. And sometimes they lived up to the hype. Sometimes they didn't. But it was more exciting because it was it was mysterious. Now you can look up anybody's Instagram and see what they look like in you know two seconds. Yeah, the mysteriousness that was the forum. exciting part. I remember like the online forums where you could see some guys would post some pictures about how, how they go, how do they look like you know for real in person like next to some other people like like, <laughs> like crazy pictures or like is that real? <laughs> yeah. Waiting for them to step on the stage, you know. Yeah. yeah, the excitement of seeing a pro in person back in the day, like mm. Stan. If I if I was a young bodybuilder. And you were a pro and just say we had, it was the same like back in the magazines back in the day. If I was going to see you in person, you was going to be in the gym. I'd be like, it's, it's Stan DeLondre. It's Stan. like, I'd be like <laughs> freaking out. I'd be like, are you, are you Stan? <laughs> I know, you know, I'd be shitting myself. And now I feel like kids walk up to you because they feel that like they know you because you put your life out there. And they're just like, what's up, Stan? <laughs> you know, it's like, like your bros already, you know, it's just such a different, such a different i remember i asked a guy who was a, like a guy competing in bodybuilding in the state competitions and i look back now and i'm like excuse me are you dave park and i'm like, like he was a celebrity and this is just in a state of <laughs> half a million people doing you know amateur bodybuilding but uh yeah it's funny how sort of <laughs> people don't have the same respect now i guess for pros but that's why we're cool to the green you know when he was training with people and like giving cues, like you were like, oh damn, he's like talking directly to us, you know, fans, like giving us all those tips, all those. That was that was awesome. That was awesome. Now everybody is putting like people would be in the gym for three months. They're putting their their videos on Instagram explaining you how to do yeah. everything. <laughs> oh, well, Stan, you, you you can have like young kids now making videos on your training saying how it's wrong <laughs> as well. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. But um, I wanted to get to a few listener questions because really we're in sort of like a middle period because we've got the Arnold, which we might actually discuss quickly the Arnold Brazil that's coming up as well because we do have actually a few updates. We've got Good Vito doing that one. Uh, well, it's actually the Arnold South America. I always call it the Arnold Brazil because it's in Brazil. But so we've got Rafael Brandau. We've got Good Vito. We've got, is Tonio. Carlos Thomas Jr. doing that? Oh, yeah, I heard he was. I heard Carlos, he was. we've got Tonio. We've got some really high caliber guys in that lineup and i think the way it sort of looks now we don't know what carlos is going to bring he's a bit of a wild card good veto we don't know exactly what how that's going to convert to the stage and then we've got raf who obviously just came third in the arnold classic in ohio and i have a feeling he might be a little bit better for this next show and then you've got tonio who's top eight in the world in the mr olympia so i suppose it comes down to how people think how much people think that Raf has improved from his 10th place at the Olympia. And is that enough to overcome uh, maybe an improved Tonio who's looking pretty crazy? So, Ron, who do you think should be the favorite going into this contest? Should it be Raf? Should it be Tonio? Or should it be someone else? Fail Brendel, hands down. He just, because uh, I was at that Olympia, I wasn't at this Arnold, but based on what I saw, he's about, he's got to be about 15 pounds heavier. The shape is still amazing. When I, when he placed was it eighth at the Olympia that he got, I went mm -hmm. or tenth uh, when he was tenth, in the tenth like, yeah. tenth okay like yeah I, he needed size everything else was there everything else was there you finding it yeah and he's got that now I mean the way he looked at that at that Arnold Classic if he just brings that I don't see Tony or Carlos I don't see them taking him out quite yet unless Carlos comes in in a crazy crazy condition uh, but even then it, it still would be very very tough. But that's the thing, though, like, you're going to stand up, like, really a lot next to these guys. They're all shorter. Like, I remember, mm -hmm. like, I, when I went to Brazil uh, in 2022 and competed there, I saw um, Good Vito there. He was getting his pro card, I believe, or about to. And uh, I was surprised. He's actually really short. Uh, wow. Yeah, he, was, he looks like, tall in like, photos, he, doesn't he? Yeah, I yeah, thought he was tall. He's mm -mm. hmm. it like 5'5", five, five, maybe. Oh, really? Yeah. 5'5"? He's really oh, sure. That's why I remember. Like I was Holy expecting crap. him. Because when I was seeing the picture, I was like, I think he's more impressive than Crizo. 
But then when I saw him in person, I was like, oh yeah, but he's way shorter than Kriza, so that doesn't do this <laughs> wow. stuff. It's like Stan, I'm you're about, Stan, 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 you're like six one. I'm no, I'm five ten. Five okay. ten. Okay, so you can gauge. Mm. <laughs> Stu Sutherland, he um he's like five nine or t- or so. And mm, no, 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 you're not. No. Well, no, <laughs> I've shrunk. I, I can sure. tell because I'm I've shrunk down to five seven and a half, and he's maybe five eight. He might be five eight oh. and a half. He might have said five, eight and a half, actually. I think I was just thinking about that then. But it, I used to think Stu was like five, six max, you know, just by looking yeah. at him because of the size of, we, we, we sort of like bag him out and say it's the size of his head. So, and plus yeah, the is. hair, it's just, there's so much the going hair. on there. <laughs> so hair. it makes Oof. him look shorter, but when he stands next to people, he's um a lot more impressive. But yeah, I, this is uh this update here. I think this is a new one from Raf who's, obviously looking I, I'm just it, he's got my favorite physique like if I was to choose an open pro physique I would choose Raf to look like because it's just there's he's got a good amount of size now he's got beautiful lines there's just he's balanced there is just nothing nothing wrong with it it's yeah, it's apart from, complete. yeah apart from I just guess making just those little improvements in and coming up but I think he's going to be very dangerous and I'm picking Raf also, but Tonio is looking pretty crazy. And I want to bring him up because he, he's actually out there in Brazil as well. And it's funny because yeah. you've got Tonio, you've got three guys that are pretty much Brazilian imports that are doing this show. You've got Tonio, who's obviously from the US, who's down there at the moment. You've got Good Vito, who's obviously from Russia originally, who's living now in Brazil. And then you've got Carlos Thomas Jr., who has been down in Brazil spending a ton of time down there and I believe he's moved down there for the show. So you got three imports that are doing it, you know? I think it's gonna be a sponsor or something. He's there. Yeah. Must yeah. Be. I think it's uh, uh Darkness who sponsor Carlos. Um and yeah. also I think is it the same for Tonio? Oh no he's Dragon no, Farmer. So yeah. But it's it's it just seems like there's a lot of money in Brazil. But Stan, do you oh, think yeah. Tonio can beat Raf, or do you think Raf will win? I think Raf will win just because he's so complete. Like, there's no pose where you're like, oh, he could lose that. Like, he's he's extremely dominant in every pose, and uh, he's taller, and I, so and they both flow very well. So I think Rafa has the edge being uh, the hometown favorite and also being a little taller. That's always a plus, you know, when you have two very close phys- physique. Because as far as just the physique, they they actually compare really well. They're both very aesthetic. Good amount of size, good conditioning. So um, I think just the stature of uh, Rafa is going to really give him the edge there. But it's not going to be a walk in the park. <laughs> Definitely not. That, and, and it says a lot about crazy. And and Ron, I, I was saying that. on a on a podcast yesterday when Tonio pulls back on this now, it gives me reminders of like Richard Jones. I don't know if you've seen that photo and. Also, um, like when he just hits it and he gets frustrations in the middle end on that bottom lat, uh, it looks like mm. there's a photo of Richard Jones. There's a photo also of uh, oh, a video of Flex Wheeler when he's doing those like bent over rows on a Smith machine when he's pulling back and he gets yeah. those crazy dry looking lines in the lower back. Yeah. And Tony is giving me those vibes. And yeah, he's just got that real different looking muscle. Yeah. I mean, I, I would want to see a little more on the legs with him. It's that that back is so overpowering in the back shots. It makes his legs look like they need another, you know, twenty percent more mass. From the front, his legs look really good. It's the back shots that, ah, oh, but man, that back is insane. Yeah, yeah. But you can't but, you can't pick. Raphael's hard to pick apart. He looks great in every single pose. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's going to be. I think it's going to be close because sometimes I'm like, ah, oh, no, Raphael will get it, and then I look at Tony, I'm like. But I'm like, this photo here, it, I, I think people would have been looking at the 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 lines here and stuff like to see if Goob needs to look at it. Because it's like, this doesn't actually look real at this point. Welcome like, to the show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I can't see this bending. So I'm like, this, no, this is real. It, but then you put just, Car- Carlos Thomas's quads next to that. And those look like elephant legs. They're just enormous. But that, but but they're even even uh Rafa has really really great quads and they separate even more, which then make them look even bigger. I think yeah, he's got more sure. separation than both Carlos and uh Antonio. 
And yeah, all really all of these guys have great quads because even Good Vito has some really good quads on him as well. So yeah. anyone else in the lineup? Because I'm not sure who else is doing it. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think William Martins is doing it. Uh, yeah, I saw that. I can't see. think I of saw who else. Somebody was somebody a guy named Miguel Chain who's like the premier journalist down there. I don't know if you know Miguel. Yeah, he Miguel's the out the other day. Uh, so I don't know who this is. David Son a Brazilian guy. Good, good Vito, Tony Burton, William Martins, Carlos Andre, Carlos Thomas. He had John De La Rosa on there, but I actually did. Yeah, I, I talked to John that. yesterday. He's not, he's, he's not, he's not doing okay. it. He said they never reached, he's never heard any, never got contacted from that at all. Not an email, nothing. Oh, really? So, uh, yeah, look at Carlos. Jeez. This is um, ridiculous. Four weeks ago. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the legs are just crazy. And the only thing that I, and, you know, Carlos, I was going to say he has no control over this, but I suppose he does in some ways, is just his ulcerative colitis. That's the only thing that worries me. And um, I suppose it, it, taking that out of it, Carlos, I mean, look at that shape. Like if this comes in really, really good condition, it's going to, yeah. it's going to place really well in any lineup, including the Olympia. He would place well if this comes in really shredded. So there's that caveat on it, but it's like, what percentage chance are we giving him to come in good enough condition to beat out this entire lineup? Especially with the I, fact I, that he I, does have ulcerative colitis. I think the the main, main thing, the main like problem with Carlos is going to be his back next to Tonio and especially next to Tonio, but next to Tonio and Rafa. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he did say as well on a podcast, I believe it was Beatty's podcast, where he said, but he had a bit of a flare up. I think the last time he um, went out to Brazil, semi recently, and hmm. he said because he was actually talking, saying, "Oh, I've been doing two a days, but but not every day of a week." But I heard that, and I was actually thinking to myself, "I'm like with ulcerative colitis, that could be pretty brutal on the body." And I was just listening along because I've had I've had a partner in the past of ulcerative colitis, and um, hmm. and he actually said, "Oh, yeah, I had a bit of a flare up once he started doing the two a days." I'm like, "Yeah, it makes sense." So I sort of toned it back, but. Yeah, I just I just really hope for his sake that it's he's able to get it under control while he's prepping because otherwise I think it will be hard to for him to come in dry and at his, at his very best. So, and it's just that finishing look to the physique. Like he can look in decent condition and, and big, but to get that water off, to get that last bit of fat off, I think your body needs to be functioning it well and not be super crazy inflamed. My son has ulcerative colitis, so I know it all too well. Oh, yeah, um, you know well. I forgot about that. Yeah, see right there? That's that's when he won the Nationals. I'd still want to see a little more separation with him, a little more chest chest thickness. He needs more of that. He's improved on it since the Nationals. He still needs more of that. Um, but, man, it's a, it's a beautiful physique. He's got so much. In some shots, he reminds me of Phil Heath. He's got so much round, full muscle. And he's a lot bigger than this now too. So even if he did bring this level of conditioning, I'm intrigued to see what this level of conditioning would look like with the amount of size he has now, or even just a tiny bit more. But this was definitely more conditioned than his pro debut. I want to say he was barely over the heavyweight limit when he turned when he turned pro. I think he was around 230. He's probably in the two, probably going to be in the 240s, I'm going to guess. High 240s for this show. And the other thing we need to appreciate too, it's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of talk about this, whether this is a thing or not, but people say there's a lot of new muscle. And Stan, you know about that. You've been gaining muscle consistently for the past however many years at a good rate <laughs> yeah. uh, from men's physique to open. But um, people say, you know, when you've got new muscle, it's harder to condition, whether that's a, it's a, it's a very bro sciencey thing. <laughs> and, but I think once that muscle is more, I suppose, stuck to your physique for a bit longer, your body, when you actually prep and diet down, tends to stay on the physique a little bit better. I think that's sort of yeah. something that everyone can agree on. And I think that's sort of what people are talking about. And when it stays it's on the physique that. better while you prep, it, it, mm. it just looks harder when you get dieted down. But if you've just gained the muscle and you diet down hard, then it tends to just flatten the muscle and just not look as good. But if he's been able to hold this muscle for, or oh, more muscle than this for a considerable amount of time, then maybe it does come in more conditions. So I'm very intrigued to see, see if he's in um, the level of conditioning that I suppose he needs to be in to, to win a show like this. 
But uh, the other guy, good veto. Sorry. Mm, yeah, let's see. Let's see, what, let's see what veto looks like. I did see a photo posted. Uh, I'm hoping it's on his profile. It's probably not. <laughs> Uh, that that was the one from the other week. I think I've actually got it saved in my saved photos. Oh, wow. That was the one from the other week. What do you think about that one, Ron? Mm. Yeah, that, that gives me uh, Dennis Wolf vibes right there. <laughs> yeah. Great mm. structure, shape, big kid. Man, he's really, he's got everything. And for, in this shot, and that's the first shot they're going to call. He's, he's first call out. Um, you know, Raphael, Raphael's going to be a more, have a more seasoned, polished look to him, I'm sure. But Mambito's going to make a, a great pro debut. Because didn't didn't he tear one of those quads to last fall? Yeah. What injury, was the yeah. exact injury? Yeah, because I've actually been trying to look at the legs and really see if there's any difference. To me, this leg looks a little bit maybe rounder. And yeah, so I'm wondering if this is the, the inju injured one. There was another photo. I'll look in my saved post, I think it is. It should be in here Him and Carlos are going to be very... Yeah. Uh, I think him and Carlos are going to compare really well. Yeah. yeah. I think we got our top four locked down in that show. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely seems like that. <laughs> I hope they have a free live stream too. Yeah, that'd be it. great. Yeah. Hopefully they've, they've done it for the other two, which is, which is incredible, really. Like, it is. Is um, it like the same production? Like, um, is Brian going there too and setting everything up, or is it like a completely different team? Um, yeah, it's a completely different team for this one. I think it's also by I don't know if it's by Tamer or Gindi or someone else, but it is a different team because Brian did put up a post and he said something about that at some point. I don't know if he put up a post, but he put up something saying that. So, yeah, I didn't save that picture of Good Vito, but I'll uh, try to find it on my phone and, and bring it up afterwards. But um, who else is there in the lineup? We've, men we've mentioned everyone. So ha let's do an early top four in order and try to nail it down. And we, you know, we'll change this, but I'll go first because I suggested it. So I'd say first I'll put Rafael Bra um, Brandeo or well, I've actually been told, I've been told two different ways to pronounce it. I've s seen people say Rafael. And then I've, I think Miguel Chain said, or Miguel Chain, whichever, <laughs> probably pronouncing yeah. that wrong too. Uh, Miguel, Miguel, um, yeah. it's the Australian thing. I'll blame, blame that. Uh, he he said it's Raphael, Raphael. Raphael. I don't know why it would be. Any... Okay, so you got Raphael first. Right. So I got Raph first, and then I've got uh, in second place. I have Tony Burton. So I feel like being eighth in the Olympia he deserves his respect there. And then yeah. it's between Carlos Thomas Jr. and Good Vito, and I'm putting Carlos Thomas Jr. ahead of Good Vito in fourth. So. Yeah, the same. Same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's boring. I get to have the same order too. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I think that would be most people's predictions as well. But I will be intrigued to see if anyone decides to pick Tonio because T Tony, I mean, one spot behind Criso, eighth in the Olympia is is pretty damn impressive, and the, the rate he yeah. improves is, you know. But he's picking for that first show. Rafael already did one show. Now he's just, you know, he's. He has what four weeks in between to just you know get a little sharper without doing anything crazy. So I think it's gonna be really good there, and he's home, so that's a plus. Yeah, Neil Hill, Neil Hill on the side. Neil doesn't miss very often. Yeah, pretty consistent with his clients. Yeah, even so I just I lost my today, you, said he... so you guys can keep talking. I just can't hear you for a second. Sorry, I was saying uh, I just saw Flex the other day, and he said he's going down to watch um, to watch Rafa in person at that show. Oh, wow. He's yeah. going yeah, to so Ireland, South America. Wow. Yeah, Flex Lewis is pretty cr close with Raf, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah, they, they since uh, I think COVID or like when Rafa went to Boca training with him. That since then they they really uh, got really close. And every time he comes down, he comes to Vegas. He's they're training together, and yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why Rafa improves his English so much too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> which is well, I've good. seen him speak English now in interviews so I'm like that's really cool like I love to see that and also Horse MD he uh Marcelo he was speaking English on um I think it's Fuad's channel and it's cool to see these guys expanding in that way because we didn't really get to see their personality before and now we get to you know hear and see these guys and I feel like we get to know them better yeah 
Yeah, now Ramon, right. Ramon and Dino needs to learn some English, please. Yeah, yeah, like, that's true. I can't. Say, I hope. Yeah, it's it's kind of arrogant for us English speakers, I think, to like force our language on everybody. But, hmm. but being an say. English speaker, being an English, <laughs> yeah, true, true, true. <laughs> being an English speaker, though, you, you sort of, uh, I suppose, because it's the most common language, you don't necessarily need to go and learn another language. But if I was from you know another country if i was into you know maybe sports in the us or something like that i i would probably be more motivated to learn english in that way but yeah that might be being a naive english speaker as well <laughs> no but that's that was for me that was the case um i used to i mean english is my third language so i was i love basketball so i would watch uh basketball everything in english you know on tv read the magazines and then when i got into bodybuilding i was reading all the forums in english watching all those videos in english and i think that that helped me learn english <laughs> yeah that's oh, how third I do language too. what was your first two french was one of them i'm assuming what was the other one german second oh wow huh and spanish fourth wow <laughs> so, so you speak four languages yeah i, I mean english and french completely fluently German, I, I don't practice much, but Spanish, but I can, you know, just take me a bit. I've been, I've been, I studied it for like 15 years, so I'm wow. pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> Four languages. Wow. I, I, just remember str <laughs> I struggled with Italian in high school. Like I, I know how to say one or two things and that's, that's about <laughs> it. I, I think it's just because I had no interest and I didn't like the teacher. You know, when you don't like the teacher, you're sort of like, yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. me <laughs> all right let's get spanish on some... spanish is the last thing i'll say and that, that came in handy because i married a cuban but go ahead next next topic <laughs> oh it, it, ron actually i want to ask with spanish because yeah. there's different dialects of spanish so did you speak yeah. the same dialect that your wife speaks or no no they teach oh. they teach spain they teach spain spanish the proper spanish in in school but it's not like they, they all understand it. It's not, it's not like there's Creole versions, like, you know, Haitians speak a totally different version of French than people in France and Brazilians speak a totally a Creole version of Portuguese. It's not like that. They just have slightly different accents and different words for different things. But any Spanish speaking person can understand and have a conversation with any other Spanish speaking person in the world. Yeah. It's quite funny. Um, <laughs> in Australia, we because obviously you've got like Aboriginal people of the native people of Australia, so they're the like the you know they say the founding people of the land and, and all that sort of stuff. And it's funny because when the whole everyone had you know the flu, when that sort of happened, there was a you know I was trying to encourage everyone to get the jab. <laughs> so the premier <laughs> of the state that I was living in at the time. See, I'm trying to use the right language. So. uh <laughs> they were doing a video uh, with an Aboriginal lady and they were speaking in what they'd call, I don't, I don't know what they'd actually call it, to be honest, but like Aboriginal language. But it was so close, like I can understand all of it. It's just slang, really. It's like sort of just slang wow. in the way they speak. And it was really, really weird. It was, <laughs> it, it was one of those things that just sort of went a bit viral after it came out because it was like, <laughs> everyone was saying, that woman seems like she's talking like she's got a gun to her head. <laughs> it was just, it was very strange. So huh. yeah, but um, I won't try to impersonate it because it'll probably come across as racist or something. So uh -huh. I'll avoid that. But <laughs> it, it was, uh, yeah, it was funny. It was like a different dialect of Australian English. But it's funny when you select uh, what type of English you want, sometimes it gives you the option on computers and things like that. It goes Australian English, British English, United States mm -hmm. English and I'm like it's got all these different ones and it's like all, all we're changing is the word color and favorite and those few things there's just not a you in your guys one and there's we have a you in ours yeah. and I change I, I, I USA mine I so any every time I put favorite because people start to say you're spelling it wrong I'm like no well not to me <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but those little differences they're so stupid but I don't know why we don't just all conform but anyway um Let's get to a few listener questions. So uh, first one off the rank. This one says, does Stanimal feel that any Mr. Olympia after Sean Roden would have been able to dethrone him if he still competed? And then he said, God, God bless his soul. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, everybody ends up getting beat at some point, right? 
And I think Hadi would have been capable of doing that. I had, I had, you know, I think I mentioned that before, but I've had Hadi winning the Olympia for a few years now. <laughs> I thought he deserved to win, like, uh, since probably 2020 or 2021. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think he would, it have been a good, a really good, uh, good one to be able to take uh, Sean, for sure. Mm. But, you know, any given day, you have to pick right and everything, so... That's why when we do this prediction, every time we're like, oh, if everybody picks at 100%, <laughs> but it's never the case. So, I think Sean uh, would have got better too, you know, like had he yeah. been able to compete yeah. the next year. Because I remember he prepped, I don't know if it was for the next year or the year after, he actually prepped for it. And yeah, I was going, he... why aren't people recognizing this? This dude's looking sick. He, Sean isn't just going to get in that condition for no reason. <laughs> so obviously yeah. he's hoping to compete. And yeah, yeah he unfortunately was, that happened. It, that's that's one thing too. Like I don't know if people remember, but the whole thing that happened and I like didn't allow him to compete. That happened like a month after the Olympia 2018. But the whole story broke like six weeks out from the Olympia 2019, or eight weeks out. It's like for some reason it took like eleven months to get out. <laughs> wow, yeah. that's crazy. So it was just basically that it got out to the media at that point. I don't know. I think just someone wanted their story out at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Obvious reason, create more pressure on him and everything. Yeah. It, it's funny when things like uh, I've seen things in other sports as well. And it's like, oh, that's convenient how that came out at that time, you know, to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, <laughs> it, you know, it's like any anytime there's a political election. All the dirt on uh, somebody somehow manages to come out like a month before the election. Yeah, something exactly. that, something that something that happened yeah. years before, and now it comes to light. Yeah, yeah thirty years ago, it comes down, and like there's always little things before the elections. You know, trying to make people, uh, you know, to trying to steer people in in their direction. <laughs> Have you guys seen the insulin price thing? The what? What the insulin price thing? So the insulin price would, what, would it go up the in the US. Insulin? So so the price of it went. So I, I know like uh Trump brought in a thing to bring the price of insulin, you know, so it was whatever amount, you know, quite cheap. And then that maintained for a little bit and then it got jacked right up to a dramatic amount higher. Like I'm talking three or four times the amount I heard. This is what I heard. And now the election's coming up. It's dipped back down and now like he's taking credit for it. It's like, well, it's back to where it was when you started and now you're yeah. taking credit for it coming down and using yeah. that as a political thing. And I'm like, well, that's the exact price of, or close to the same price <laughs> it was before. I'm like, it's funny how these like little manipulative things happen, but now people cotton onto it yeah. more because now you've got people in the comments because you didn't have that. Yeah. Like, 15 years ago but now you have people yeah. calling it out more and it's yeah it's it's quite funny to watch like the evolution of how like even an election works how <laughs> things happen with bodybuilding contests now it's very common for you know once a contest prejudging happens in bodybuilding everyone's on instagram and then you got to wonder which bodybuilders go on and actually look at all these comments because i think i think fans would be surprised to know how many bodybuilders would actually jump on their pros and actually see their comments because if there's 200 or there's 100 comments on a post on buyers and tries, they might scroll through and sort of glance at some of them. But then some guys will, will avoid that. Stan, what do you do? Do you avoid comments or? No, I don't really avoid it. No. I, I, like for me personally, like I'm pretty confident in what I do. So it doesn't really matter. Like uh, sometimes I like to get back to it, like, you know, respond to stuff and create more engagement and things like that uh but most of the time i uh i just enjoy reading just to see what you know people thought process is <laughs> yeah yeah for sure and it doesn't it doesn't bother you at all like not too much not really anymore no i think maybe more in the past that's i don't know when it's personal i don't really care because <laughs> i'm pretty confident with you know who i am and what i do and all that so it doesn't really affect me but it affects me when it concerns other people like that i yeah. care for that's that that yeah that bothered me yeah yeah that that's the same as me as well it's you get you can get more offended for someone else because you know if it doesn't bother you too much you're yeah. good but you go might go oh, okay yeah, maybe 10 years ago this would have really bothered me and now it's about someone that i care about and it's yeah it's worse yeah. But i wanted to put yeah. up this as well just to show, show obviously sean roden and 
<clears throat> remind people of how good he was obviously when he won the Mr. Olympia like people well, that was a blurry one I think but yeah pe- people forget, sort of forget I guess because you know he was awesome and like one of those really aesthetic guys that was cool to see with Mr. Olympia this is obviously I don't think this is the year he won the Olympia though was it you know like it's no. funny because when I saw um, Samson and the Arnold UK there was some some things he did like some poses the way he hit them i was like that looks just like sean (laughs) that was back when stan was um uh turning from a pretty boy to a hardcore bodybuilder (laughs) (laughs) that's about 40 pounds ago easy (laughs) yeah it's crazy it's crazy that you've been able to be like a top 10 classic guy and then have to go. It's not even like it's you going to two twelve. You're going to open. <laughs> you know, you go into that like next yeah, next probably. level. Yeah. So <laughs> that that's a huge jump. How long did you have between your last classic show and your first open show? One week. Oh yeah! Wow. <laughs> yeah. I remember that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's wow. right. <laughs> yeah, I did the uh, San Marino Pro that. the week after the Olympia 2019, where I got tenth place, and I was you tried to fill up a heap, uh, didn't you? Huh? You tried to fill up a ton, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I went up like 16 pounds and I was still like probably one of the most conditioned guys on stage, if not the most conditioned guy. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I was, Rolly won that show. Nathan was second. Lucas Osladil was third. It was a good show. Yeah, that's cool. It's funny in bodybuilding how some of these guys like Lucas Osladil, I think I saw a photo of him the other day and he's dramatically downsized and it's like i didn't even know the dude retired like he didn't oh, even wow. get nothing really came out he was just yeah massively downsized and every time a pro bodybuilder downsizes and their head head looks normal as a pro all of a sudden <laughs> it makes their head look enormous it's like so i was like this guy yeah, yeah and i think just as well because you're used to seeing the big body with it that you think yeah. that all of a sudden they look like a bobblehead but they probably don't it's probably just what i'm used to <laughs> so. does, does he look younger though he did. He did. He put up one video. I think he was speaking in English. It was, it was quite funny. I don't know why, but I, I remember I was just like, he's like, yes. <laughs> just the way he's talking. Like, oh, the Polish that. accent. Yeah. I think he's Polish, yeah. right? Lucas. Czech Republic? I think he's oh, from maybe. Czech, Czech Republic. Oh. One of those countries. I'm pretty sure it's Czech Republic, though. Yeah, you might be right. I get very confused between all those countries. I'm like, I, I just know. I'm like, okay, Eastern European. <laughs> this guy, whatever. <laughs> um all right where's the other questions oh there's a question who do you guys think i'm going to make a separate video and i tried to put this together before but i got locked out of my instagram accounts and i don't even know if i can get into them on my phone still um so i was having Jeez. trouble pulling some of the photos but um dexter someone asked dexter jackson at his very best versus hardy chupin at his very best which was most likely the 2024 arnold classic mm-hmm. who wins because dexter obviously had that consistency throughout his career where he brought a great package so many times, but does his best beat Hardy Chupin's very best? Stan, what do you think? It's tough. Um, I think, I think, I think Hardy has more size, you know, more, more, more muscle on his frame than, than um, Dexter, but Dexter is just so pretty, you know, it's so well put together. Yeah. So it's, I would have to see it on stage. I don't know. If you put it together, maybe I have better. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, do that after this video. It'll be on the main desktop bodybuilding channel. I'll, I'll do a video side by side, Dexter Jackson. And what's Dexter's best as well? Because Dexter actually, I think he said that he thinks his best is the 2009 Mr. Olympia, which is the year yeah. after he won. And I think he placed third at that one as well. And Branch Warren. Yeah beat him yeah. he was i think a little bit small tiniest bit smaller maybe than 2008 but he was looked even more conditioned it was like super super shredded so it's um yeah i'll, I'll do versus the 2009 dexter because he said that's his best but do you guys think it's 09 08 one of the arnold's i mean it never was for sure so it's, i don't know <laughs> yeah. i don't know what his yeah. best look and it's pretty yeah. similar yeah. too there was all those memes of him you know like from 1999 to like 2020 like he looks the same every year <laughs> yeah, very consistent. it's yeah, incredible I'd, it to, I, I'd pick i would pick dexter i'd pick dexter yeah i mean how he does he's thicker and denser Hadi's a shorter guy with more muscle 
Actually, they might be around the same height, but it's just, you know, yeah, Hotties, look at those legs are way bigger than Dexter's legs ever were, but Dexter's yeah. shape was so much prettier than this. So much prettier. Mm -hmm. And he was very consistent. When, when Hottie's very consistent as well. I don't take anything away from the guy. It wouldn't be like Dexter would blow him off the stage or anything like that, but I just thought Dexter had one of the prettiest physiques of all time. Yeah. I, 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 I really wonder on today's judging standard or even judging standards of five years ago or just how it's sort of changed over the years. I, I think it would be a super close show. I just think Hardy, if you put the best Dexter on stage next to this, I think it would be incredibly close. Don't get me wrong. And I think the best Dexter would beat Samson from his Arnold Classic for sure. But I think Hardy might just get the nod just on freakiness and how much smaller Hardy's waist got in this show. I think he brings enough of that aesthetics to probably get the win. But yeah, it's it, we'll, we'll oh. never know. Also, like the, the size of the legs, I feel like they just went way up the last few years. And so I don't know how Dexter legs would compare next to that right now. Well, I think with like Hardy, it's... Hardy's legs, yeah. I, I looked back in 2019 and they were really, really round then. And it seemed like mm -hmm. last, just at the last Olympia, they were just a little bit flattened or regressed, but the rest of him was, was really quite big. But then it seemed like for this show, they came right back up. Because when I'm seeing side by sides, I did a side by side of the 2019 Hardy versus the 2023 Olympia Hardy, and it looks like his legs almost just didn't have that same roundness and pop. But it seemed like it was more back at this show. It just seemed like they came out more and then went more in at the knees, and it just seemed like there's a bit more here. So yeah, there's there is definite size on but, those legs, and he's hard from you know now he's hard from every angle. At the Olympia, you can say the back's a little soft. Yeah. No, but that's why that's one of the reasons I don't believe he's uh, he, he's done three hours of cardio. I think this is a miscommunication, like a, transla a translation issue or something. I would see him three hours of training, but three hours of cardio that would eat the legs, and he's lean all the time. Like, why would you need that much cardio? I, I don't Mio said that, didn't he? But I think that just someone said he was training like tw twice a day for like an hour and a half, two hours, and then some, it started being like, oh, he's doing three hours of cardio. But I don't see him need <laughs> needing to do. I mean. Doing that much cardio is, you know, catabolic. That's not what we want. Like, you to be big and muscular, you need to do intense workout. You know, like a sprinter, not like a, you know, running a marathon and doing mm -hmm. cardio for hours is, is kind of productive to what we're trying to do. So I have a hard time believing that. I'd be great if uh, Harry could clarify that. Yeah, for yeah. sure, absolutely. But yeah, regardless, I mean, it was a great package for Hardy. I think. Like, do we all agree that this is Hardy's best? Yes. Yeah. 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 And that seems to be the consensus with everyone. I think he was, he was absolutely phenomenal. I'll just uh, type in Dexter Jackson. So those that are watching can, um, can see obviously the great Dexter Jackson. But uh, yeah. You just, I love the flow of this pose. You know, it's a completely, it is that apples and oranges versus Hardy. It really is. Round. Yeah, but Hardy has even more taper on his waist, like with yeah. that vacuum. Like, yeah. Dexter, more rounder, you know, stomach a little bit. It was totally okay for the time. I mean, it's not, it was not a bubble guy at all, but it's a little more like Hardy is sucked in, you know, like you, you can't really do anything more. <laughs> Like, you don't think you can pull it any, even more than that. So, it, yeah, with the judging criteria and different times. I mean, Dexter is one of the best ever, so. When De Dexter's That's, waist was like this, like, it, it was it was tight but before he got any sort of, a, he got it had a little bit more distension gradually, it seemed, as his career went on a little bit. But when it was tight like this, I actually, it is the most unique looking midsection, but I sort of liked it. Like I really did. And I think it really popped with the rest of his physique and the fact that his lats sort of came out like that. And when I saw Dexter in person, I was so much more impressed seeing him in person. And no one really spoke too much about that. But sitting down where near where the judges sit at the Australian Pro and having Dexter versus Kai on stage, everyone was going into it because I think Kai won the Arnold the week before. Everyone's going, Kai will win, Kai will win. And everyone said, the judges and everyone said Kai was actually better in Australia. But I was looking at it going, 
Dexter's like I was just obsessed with his physique. Like he was hitting that most muscular, the crab most muscular. And in person, you really oh, yeah. notice how the insertions come right in between the arms and the shoulders. It just goes right, right in, and then balloons out, and the muscle just looks just so fresh and crisp. And yeah, I, I was just so impressed with Dexter in person that I was like, I like Dexter more than than Kai in person. But Kai obviously had that freak factor. But Dexter I mean, always brought it to Australia. If you ask me which physique I, I like the best overall, I would say Dexter. Who would win nowadays on the stage? I think Hadi would would edge him a little bit, just because yeah. of the extra size. I feel like his legs, you know, like when you just do that from relaxed, they looked a little small. for nowadays standards. It looked a little, you know. I mean, you yeah. know, after the arm sick, even Tyler said uh, Hadi could use more legs. So, <laughs> you know, I he think did? I heard that. Yeah. What? Yeah. More legs. More quads. Oh, I mean, I'll just start from the side. But otherwise, I don't know where. <laughs> no, no. He said, he said, he said, I think he said, didn't he say they both have, uh, yeah, he said they either both have great uh, quads, but then Hardy lacks a bit in some areas of the legs, or he said vice versa. I can't remember quite what he said, but I did say I remember he, that. I was shocked because I was like, okay, hamstring, I can see it, or maybe a little bit the quads from the side. But he specifically said he could use a little more legs, maybe just to balance out both legs. Maybe that's what he meant, but uh, I was just struck by that statement. Was, was he saying legs from the side? Because I remember when. No, uh, that's fine. Really? I've got to review I, that. I think <laughs> that overall, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah. 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 I was, I was shocked. <laughs> yeah. He's got some pretty decent legs. I think it was, uh, I remember him saying something about the side leg and him saying that Samson. And when, when you see that new footage that Gil, uh, Gilco put out, the Arnold classic of Samson and Hardy, you get sort of a, another perspective because we got to see the webcast. We've seen the iPhone mm -hmm. videos and some other photos. Oh, yeah. And then you get to see that new footage and you get to see the detail in ha Samson's hamstrings. Like Samson, I think that conditioning at the Arnold UK was underrated. And the fact that there was multiple judges that had him first place there, because when you're seeing his hamstrings and they, they look, hamstrings were damn detailed. The glutes, yeah, that there's, there's more that could come in on the glutes. The, the back, there could be a little bit more there in terms of conditioning, but I think that will come with time. But it, it goes to show that Samson can get in condition, and I think it's going to give people a bit more hope going into the Olympia that, you know, if this was the yeah. best ever Hardy the two weeks before, even if he was, was a little bit off, and Samson still took some first-place votes off him. I mean, mm -hmm. if Samson improves more again and Hardy comes in the same as the Arnold UK, that you'd sort of think that, you know, Samson sort yeah, of has yeah, the yeah, chance to win the Olympia. Yeah, he has room to improve. I think it, this glute, like, he, he could use a little more development there too. That's the thing. His glutes are pretty small. His quads are so big, obviously. I think that's getting most of the work. The, the quads are getting most of the, the loads on his on his workouts. Um, mm -hmm. But there's another thing I want to address. Like I, I mentioned last time that I thought he looked a little top heavy at Samsung, even though his legs are crazy. I think that came from the, the footage, you know, it was sh shot from the top. And usually yeah. we, we used to go from the lower. And so I think that's where it, I was like, it looks like his legs are a little small compared to his upper body. And I, I was surprised by that at the Arnold UK, but I think that was just the angle of the camera. Because like when you see Gilko's, you know, shots from under the, under the stage, it, it looks totally balanced. Yeah. And it goes to show as well, I actually looked at uh, photos today of Dexter Jackson because I was trying to find those 2009 Mr. Olympia photos. I looked at two different sets of photos. One was from muscular development, I think from a pre-judging of Dexter <clears throat> and then one of them was from RX from the finals the ones from MD Dexter looks insane he looks great it's got I think it's the Olympia and they've got a bit of a starry background and mm. it's like crisp and I think the photos the photos are by um oh what's his name awesome photographer for MD for years um Perbinal Perbinal yeah Perbinal. yeah but yeah. they're Perbinal shots and they, they just look crazy and the ones on RX you look at Dexter and you go this is probably worse than average Dexter conditioning. And it just goes to show that the one, the lighting was a little bit different because pre-judging finals, but the photo, the photographer, the lighting, how they have the camera set up will change your conditioning straight up. So sometimes you see photos online and you hear the online commentators saying no one's in condition. Normally, if I see no one's in condition, I'm like, okay, let's just change our idea of what good condition is in this show because what we're seeing isn't maybe the reality. Like that show you did last year, Stan? Was it Chicago or yeah, one of those ones? Yeah. You could not tell yeah. what was going on at that show online. No. You really couldn't. 
Yeah, no. I, I tried to give my opinion, but yeah. <laughs> but the was background like, was kind of the same color as a tan, and I think that's you want more contrast. You know, you, you have to just have something that really contrasts with the, the skin color. Yeah, plain, plain um, back backdrops. That's what everybody wants. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> apparently, apparently, I think Fuad's doing that at the Detroit Pro, so hopefully oh, wow. he starts a bit of a craze. So oh, I heard okay. he was the one that. mentioning it, so that makes sense. It's good that he is actually. You know, applying his own uh, recommendation. <laughs> well, could you imagine though if he he said, "Oh, why, I don't know why they don't just do black backdrops," I and mean, then he didn't an LED screen behind it. <laughs> <laughs> he would he would cop it from everyone, so he, he has to yeah. really. And I mean, it's cheaper, and people will love it. So, sure. why not? It's cheaper. Yeah, I don't know how he's going to promote that, but I don't think you need the, necessarily the, those sponsor on the stage. To be honest, personally, like. If, with all the social media, like the live streams, live streams. I think there's other options. Where, yeah, where you can set that up, where it's more, actually more in your face. Because when it's a background, it, you don't even really pay attention. Okay, of course, it's in your subconscious. You you still absorb the brands. But like when you have like 30 brands, like you know, everywhere on, on, on the back yeah. or on screens, mm. it's like, what does it really do? Like, we're not, it's, it's distracting, but I don't think it's actually helping either the the visibility of the sponsors and even worse, the, 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 the quality of the showing of the athletes, which is the product we're trying to, that's what bringing the views, right? So. Yeah. yeah. That, that's why I prefer it to be placed a little bit differently advertising, because if you want to advertise to people at the show and to say it and all that sort of stuff, yeah, you can have it off to the side. You can even have it to the side of when you zoom out on the live stream. Yeah. Have it around the top, have it down yeah. the very sides stuff like that mm -hmm. or you can even have a, a screen that goes off and on between competitors or something you know where guys go off stage mm -hmm. and then start showing some ads for a minute and a half and then or a minute and go back to it there's just i think there's ways yeah. around it and don't get me wrong uh, some promoters have bought these screens and probably paid a decent amount for them i don't, I don't know if they bought them actually or if they hire them but if they're hiring them then they can change it won't run do you know if they hire them or buy these screens because some of them are pretty huge. i don't know yeah, no, so, I assume I, they rent them. I, I don't think it would make sense to buy them unless you're putting on many, many shows a year. Because that's yeah. actually one thing I've always thought of, and I've always thought, yeah, but they've bought the screen, so I, you know, I'm like, well, maybe they could just make them black. But now I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I'm sure they're hired because they would be expensive as hell. So, yeah, but that's the thing. Even if you have a screen and you turn it off, just a little bit of light coming from it, that's always, yeah. you know, it's going to be not good for the rendering of the athletes physique of package is bringing on stage yeah especially with the cameras yeah. nowadays it's, i mean it's just you know people who understand photography and then understand that you don't want to have light coming from behind the subject <laughs> yeah yeah and the, you could see even with, as much as i love the arnold's light and i thought it was really really good and everything you can still see on the some of the gilco videos it's because i think it's to do with like the frame rate and all that sort of stuff you can see behind Samson, it's going like, it's flickering the light. And it's like, mm. it makes even Gilco, who's the best in the business, he's struggling with the, whatever it is, the aperture or whatever on the camera to make it so that mm. background's right. And also the yeah. foreground, which is the main thing, the athlete looks right as well. So there's definitely, when, whenever there is a light screen or anything behind the athlete like that, you can get away with little bits, mm. but if it's too much, it throws off. The, the look of a photo the video all that stuff and did you, i didn't ron did you see um brian powers on nick strength and powers channel no i did not he did an interview with him yeah you mm -hmm. you got to check it out it, it, i don't think oh, he wow. got that many views really which i was surprised but i think everyone goes to nick strength and power just for his bodybuilding news videos but it was yeah. really cool because brian actually spoke a ton about the lighting he spoke about the uh, setting the stage lighting up for the live stream to look good on the live stream and then setting it up to look best in person for the athletes to be judged and for the fans there. And he said there is a difference there and he would actually changed the live stream between pre-judging and finals for the Arnold Classic to make it better. And it was dramatically better at the finals and that they spent hours and hours trying to make those changes to make it better for the live stream. And I'm, I'm just so impressed with the fact that they're listening you know, they're listening to the fans. They're listening to Brian speaks to me, probably speaks to you, probably speaks to, I know he speaks to a ton of different people, you know, here and there. So it's good that I think the fans are being listened to, even if they don't implement every single thing, 
the fact that he even spoke on it, it makes you have more understanding. It has more fans have more understanding just for having yeah. that transparency. So yeah, you have to you have to check it out. It's really, really good. I did watch Definitely. it, yeah. It's good. Yeah, yeah, cool. I was gonna ask you too, Stan. But um and we want to see more of it. And we saw Tyler Mannion putting out his uh video today about the open and Hardy versus Samson, which was awesome to see. Absolutely love it. Um Next listener question. What have we got here? Um, yeah, I think that's very needed. Like what Tyler's doing, you know, it's really gives more transparency to to the whole process. People understand better. It gives this like you know, people talking about politics and all this stuff for the years now. It's like okay, well, we know we have a feedback, so then people improve. If they improve based on this feedback, they should place higher, right? And it, it should those feedbacks that they give every time they're they're following the same the same criteria. So it's uh it's consistent, it's transparent, and I think that makes the sport better and less uh you know all that politics bullshit uh, talk behind the scenes, you know. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Sure. Stan, I saw someone asked about this recently. I think they dropped it in my DMs or something, but I think we mentioned on the show about your all the little different things you do in terms of your mm. modalities and protocols and some people might call it biohacking, you know, like whatever yeah. it is in terms of just getting better for bodybuilding. And I don't think people really realize because you don't speak about it too much. Like you see a little bit here and there about it where you're putting out things of the different work you're getting done, but mm. you do, everyone spoke about Jay doing it back in the day with, you know, X amount of hours of massage a week and stuff, but you're doing a lot of different modalities and things. And yeah. Ron, even last week on the show, he's putting on like the the blue light glasses when the yeah. show was getting later and he's putting on some cream on his eyes. Like he, he like has <laughs> all the setups and I'm like jealous, but Stan, man, run us through some of the things you do and how many hours you're putting in a week to this stuff. Cause I think it would blow people's mind. Yeah. So I just wrote it down today because I made a post saying hey, nobody oh, good luck out working me. And someone just said like, let's just say we work as hard. And I was like, I'm sorry, but I have to disagree with that. <laughs> and I, I listen to that, everything I'm doing. And it comes down. So in a one week, you have 168 hours. And out of these 168 hours, I spend 12 hours, 10 to 12 hours training, you know, five days a week. Uh, 14 hours eating. That's, you know, that's what everybody does, right? Then I'd spend seven hours in the hyperbaric chamber a week. I do seven hours of mineral soak, eight hours of breast work. Three and a half hours of red lights therapy, four hours of dry kneeling a week, three and a half hours of stretching a week, about six to 10 hours of tissue work uh, that I, uh, by a professional, like fascia manipulation. So like every day, about an hour and a half to two hours, except Sunday. I do 10 to 14 hours myself because I've learned how to release the fascia. So I do all myself too, uh, on my own downtime, when I'm driving, when I'm watching TV, or anything. I do... 14 hours of compression boots, you know, like the new, uh, new uh, what is it? Normatech, Normatech boots. They have the hip compression. They have the arms compression. I do that so like every what's day. It, what, quickly, what's, it, what's the advantage of those? Oh, it, re it reduces, um, it imp improves your recovery by about 40 hours for your legs, for example. So <laughs> if you recover faster, which is always the key, you know, that's why we take steroids, increase recovery. Uh, so anytime you increase recovery, you, you make sure you completely... Uh, maximize the hypertrophy and that you can actually perform better the next workout so then you can actually produce more muscle over time and uh, i was and then, yeah so then three hours of newbie steam so uh, electro stimulation but like in the recovery mode a week and then uh, you know there's 60 hours of sleep so out of uh, 168 hours a week you take about 60 hours of sleep you have 108 hours I think I'm at 93 hours a week of all this stuff. So it left around 15 hours just to cook and commute. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man. Wow. Ron, have yeah. you ever heard anyone? I've never heard anyone doing this amount of extra therapies. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was crazy hearing Jay doing five or six hours of massage a week. So right. to hear you're doing more than that plus, <laughs> plus but, you know, the other stuff. Actually, I was super in, in, interested because uh, Philly has been way more active lately, you know, on podcasts. He's been on uh, a Who bunch of them. Uh, Phil Heath. Oh, Phil Heath, yeah. yeah. He has he's promoting um, Breaking the Olympia. Yeah. Yes. So for that reason, I think he started promoting it. And he was on Bradley Martin Raw Talk like last a couple of days ago, maybe. And he said himself was doing hyperbaric chamber. He He's doing all those biohacking stuff. 
And um, it, it was super interesting because you never really spoke about it that, that, that I know of. And that's what I've been doing for two years now. Yeah. So <clears throat> the key is maximizing recovery, make sure I can last in the sport, being healthy. I'm trying to, you know, I use all the biohacking things you can you can think of, you know, like I'm trying to do like I sleep on a, every night on a grounding mat, uh, you know. I was going to I was going to say I know what you're going to say. I used to have one. I used to have one. Huh? Uh, yeah. I used to have a gr grounding mat. Yeah, I had one and I I some people bought the grounding sheets. I just had the grounding pad cuz I was too poor and I just put it across my legs at the bottom of the bed or just wrapped it around my legs sometimes <laughs> and just have it on. But in yeah, Australia like because I, I, I do you know if they work with adapters or not? What do you mean adapter? So I bought mine for the US, but you had to have like a US to Australian plug adapter. Oh, you have to test the, the currents. Yeah, you have to make sure it's grounding. It's yeah, so I was, I was never 100% sure because I bought, bought a US one and I didn't think about it before I got it. So I never knew if it was actually working. <laughs> so that, that yeah. used to do my head in. I think I just gave, I think I lost it actually, to be honest, and then I gave it didn't bother yeah that's actually really morning. good it's it's one thing that it seems like it keeps the fascia more more malleable you know more soft so you, you yeah. avoid all the sensification and which can lead to le less lack of mobility and which gonna you know if you lack of mobility le less range of motion less range of motion less muscle growth etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah, yeah that's why with the hyperbaric chamber how many hours a week was that seven hours one hour a day so where where's the hyperbaric chamber is it <laughs> it's at a recovery place but i'm gonna have my own probably uh soon hopefully uh, i'm gonna start working with da vinci medicals who made a lot of uh equipment um for recovery for you know oxygen generator for ewat like exercise with oxygen therapy uh they do hyperbaric chamber red light beds they do all kind of stuff like that and i've been a lot you know into that so i'm excited <laughs> to get my own when you think you're doing well, Ron, in terms of this extra stuff, I do a couple of cold showers a week and then I might do a meditation and then do some stretching and I'm like <laughs> killing it. I'm, try, I'm trying to stack everything. You know, I'm, I'm never doing just one thing. Uh, if I'm sitting watching TV, I'm going to be on you know, having compression boots, having extra stimulation on me, at least one or two things, you know. I'm and eating. Just, wow. <laughs> yeah. If I'm eating, I might Damn. be driving too, you know, like I'm not <laughs> going to waste time. <laughs> That's so funny. That's awesome. That's I, of, uh, I love it. Huh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> explains why it partially explains why you've done so well in the past couple of years. You made, I, you know, I never saw you doing as well as you've been doing. I, I really hand it to you. The way you were looking at the shows last year. year. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I never saw that coming. I was like, eh, this guy might be okay, but you know, you, you almost won that. You were, you were in those callouts for Chicago. You were in the, you were in the mix in that show for sure. Yeah, for sure. sure. Yeah. I did 35 pounds since then. And I mean, close to the same condition so i'm excited for this season for sure dang uh, yeah. yeah but yeah that's, that's, that's my, my you know it's kind of like when you watch all the top athletes you know kobe Bryant. this what can you do you know you, you, i know like i started later open bodybuilding but you know i've learned a lot so and it's just, just trying to apply all these things and having a plan on how I'm going to catch up with those guys. And once I pass them, making sure they now catch up on with me. So I got to do all the extra stuff, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's a lot, but they, when you listen to Dorian Yates, he was living, you know, same thing, just everything is directed to improve his bodybuilding. He was taking naps after his, his training, you know, I think that's what it takes to get to the top. And uh, I believe I will be soon. Right on. For sure. Yeah. I love it, man. Um, one more question and then we'll wrap this thing up. Um, how long have we been live for? How long have we been going for? An hour know. and 14 minutes, roughly. Okay, cool. <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do one more question. I wasn't sure. I actually got off. Uh, just then I thought, have we ever even live for 30 minutes? <laughs> and then no, I was, <laughs> I, was a little, I was a little bit off then. Um, no. So the last question is someone asked about how we got into YouTube. So Ron, we sort of discussed yours before about getting into it 18 years ago. I mean, obviously going your whole journey through with muscular development, but do you want to give a bit of a summary on how how things started with you on on YouTube, or I suppose maybe in bodybuilding? Full stop. Oh, um, YouTube. I mean, it was it was a new platform. It had only been around, I think, a year when I started my channel, and I was just uploading really basic, crappy clips. Nothing. I have them all still on my channel. There's, they're nothing special, but there was so little, such little competition back then. I have videos with like. 
I have one of Steve Kuklo curling some hundred pound dumbbells it has like almost 600,000 views. And, you know, I can't get that kind of those kind of views now because everyone, yeah. their grandmother has a YouTube channel. Uh, yeah. I don't want to go, you don't want to hear I started bodybuilding. That was like a thousand years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but Stan, but, uh, how did you, how did you start on YouTube? Cause how many, how many subs in um, that do you have on YouTube? Uh, last time I checked, it was like 60,000 around there. Yeah. Um, so I started like it was a resolution actually. I think it was 2015 or 16, and I decided like you know I want to be more active on YouTube because I feel like you can share more than just what you can share on on Instagram, which is shorter, or you know just pictures or shorter videos. So you can get more in depth about you know what you're doing and create more of a relationship with the viewers. And I started doing just like daily vlogs, basically like during my preps, and. Uh, yeah it caught up especially i was doing in french and in france there was nobody in the u.s doing what i was doing so mm. people into, into bodybuilding that they were interested for sure it's so hard to know for, i imagine for you for urs for all uh, like uh roman fritz i know he's spoken about it whether to do your content in your yeah you know, that's hard <laughs> your 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 i suppose the, the the nationality of where you're from or to do it yeah. in English, because English is going to have more mass exposure. You're going to be known more, you know, for bodybuilding, you're going to be known more to the judges, the fans in the US where a lot of the contests are and where the Mr. Olympia yeah. and the, the Arnold Classic are. Or do you do it in your, you know, native language and actually appeal to your home fans? Because I know Roman says when he does too much in English, he's the German fans get really upset and like as like almost yeah. like he's disrespecting them or something. So how yeah. do you how do you know what to do with that well, for me it was just like tap into you know my my strengths what what can be different because when i started it was a lot of people already on youtube doing english content so it was like you know why would they follow me they don't know nothing about me but french people they don't have anybody that does what i do in the u.s so it was a no-brainer uh but i think if you want to do like you're doing two channels now you know have one for the podcast one if you want to do like English and French, you should have almost two. You should have two channels. You should, to be honest. Yeah, we'll get upset. That's a good, good example. There's a you know who Dura Mamoudel Dura is. Dura, he was a he was a really good two twelve bodybuilder out of Montreal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he does all his content is in Arabic, all of it. I don't think he does anything in English. Right. He, millions and millions of subscribers, millions of views, because he's he knows that there's a huge audience in the uh, in the Middle East and other places where they speak Arabic, and he's giving them. He's giving them content from someone who's still has his pulse on the industry. Um, but man, he's, he's killing it. So I think if he had done it in English, there would be too much competition. He wouldn't have stood out yeah. and he would have lost out on that whole, on that whole fan base. For sure. I think yeah. you should tap into your, what, what makes you different at first. And then if it grows and, you know, there's interest, then yeah, expand in, in, into like a more international language and reach more people. But I think you should start with your niche. 100 percent, and it's choosing that niche and making sure that it's not too niche you know what i mean like yeah. if you start a if you start a niche bodybuilding channel and it's about wheelchair bodybuilding how many views are you going to get it's that's too niche you know bodybuilding almost as a whole is the niche and then you've got channels like uh uh oh my god uh mark's max muscle his name just escaped me and he focuses on just comparing two guys together and that's 90 percent of his oh, content yeah you know, so he's he's yeah. got that niche within bodybuilding that does really well. And then you've got other mm -hmm. people that, you know, Fuad, podcasting is his main niche, you know, that's his main thing on his channel. And you got mine, yeah. which is news and then other ones. And, and everyone has their own sort of way of doing it. But if you go and do the exact same thing, a channel that's already doing really well, and you're doing that, you have to do it much better to, to, to get close or to overtake them. Otherwise, it's you're always going to be... Mm -hmm step back because why would they watch you over someone else unless you have some some different news or something yeah. like that so or you're quicker or you have a point of difference and also with the algorithm you have to to share a certain type of content to be pushed so if you if you're doing like 10 minutes video in english but when you're doing french video it's like an hour it's, it's not going to work well on the same channel mm -hmm. i think that's why with olympia tv now um it, the one thing that hurts them is probably that they, they put Brazilian Portuguese. content, Portuguese, mm -hmm. and they also put English in. But just the way the, the the algorithm works now, it sort of screws you. So if I'm putting podcasts up, 
Ron, I sort of discovered this. Like if you're putting long form and then short form up, it just doesn't seem yeah. to work on the same channel. One kills the hmm. other. Whichever one your subscribers are subscribed mm. for, that's what they're going to yeah. watch. And if any, if they mm. don't watch your other, your new type of content, then you just really have to just create a new channel because otherwise it's just like my mm. podcast wow. and interviews. Like I did some interviews and I'm thinking about the body, the level of bodybuilders I did. Plus I made a really good thumbnail. I thought the title was good. And it's, you know, it's Derek Lunsford or someone and it gets, you know, 5,000 views. And then my next bodybuilding news video gets 25,000 or 20 or whatever. And it's like, yeah, yeah that's, that just doesn't. When I, when I really started on YouTube, I had, um, I'm going to give him uh, props because he helped me out. It was Rob Riches. It was huge on, on, on YouTube. He was like the one of pioneers. And he told me a bunch of, you know, giving a bunch of tips on how to grow my channel. And he was one thing, he was saying to be consistent. Like almost like, you know, on your banner, have like, you know, two, two videos a week, you know, every Thursday, every Sunday, 10 a.m., new content, you know, so people know. And if you post always at those right time and or go live at those times, it's what works the best. So having similar content at the same time with regularity and consistency, that's what really going to draw um, the best uh, response from the algorithm. Yep, 100%. And you see that with Sam Sulik daily videos he actually put up a post the other day he was traveling back from the uk and it was the first time in so long that he hadn't put a video up that day which is oh. wild <laughs> and he said no video today guys traveling back from the uk and then you know a bunch of people oh. say okay well i'm not doing my cardio today <laughs> and all this sort of stuff but um yeah consistency is the thing it is 100 percent the thing and that's what i'm trying to do with this because today i was meant to have a few other people on as well as this and or potentially and then it was just me and Stan for a little bit. And then that's why I reached out to you as well, Ron. Cause I'm like, Oh, maybe Ron wants to jump on, jump on as well. And then I still had a few people that are more potentially still are maybe to jump on, but it's probably a little late now, but, um, but yeah. And I was like, it's one of those ones where you could go, Oh, I can't get anyone else on. I'm not going to try to reach out to people. And you could just go, ah, oh, nah, we'll just do one podcast this week. But then I'm like, nah, no matter what, Two yeah, a week, you gotta, two a week, two yeah. a week, no matter what. And just go, just suck it up and go, okay, I'm just going to contact more people. And normally the amount of people I contacted, I'd have 10 people say yes. So eight people say yes, but it's just, everyone was like, I asked Akeem and I asked also Terry Kilgindi as well. Um, yeah. They were doing a video today, no? Exactly. They, they were, I, I literally, I messaged Terry and this is just pure coincidence. I was just going through my inbox and, I, mm -hmm. and I'm like, and that's when I found your message on. I'm like, shit, I didn't get back to you. And so I was replying, okay. I was responding to people while then asking other people to go on the pod, a few people to go on the podcast. And um, yeah, I, Tarek and also Akeem were in my inbox. So I messaged both of them. And then Tarek says, I'm interviewing Akeem in an hour. And then Akeem writes back yeah. up now. And I was like, dude, I'm literally doing a podcast. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I saw, I saw. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it's- Even if it's, it's two people and you know, it, it just, yeah, it's more important to do it than, it's like stretching, you know, it's more, you have to- if you don't do it like every 12 hours or so, you're losing it. So you have to stay yeah. consistent, even though if you're doing a shorter version or whatever you're doing, you just got to keep doing it at the mm -hmm. same interval. Because I saw one, one good quote on a YouTube. I started watching these videos of how to grow your channel and all that because I'm trying to do that. And a good phrase was, uh, done is better than perfect. Yeah. So yeah. it's better to put something up that maybe you're not 100% satisfied with than not putting anything up at all. Yeah. yeah i definitely get the thing with bodybuilding news videos like sometimes if i don't get it done when i want to get it done and then more bodybuilding news starts coming in like oh good Vito's posted a photo now oh now this this interview's come yeah. out i know there's news in that when i watch it i'm like oh, it's another story and i get so many news stories that it's almost like overwhelmed with how much is in there and i've sometimes done them and like, i'm going to do every story and it's a 19 minute bodybuilding news video with 15 stories but to pull every single one of those videos and photos and then screenshot the captions and then overlay it then you know put the little thing behind it and make the background of it look like you know blue or whatever behind that to make it look good it's like okay if i'm covering five stories because then i've noticed with some other channels i'll do three stories in a video and that's it like three little stories super easy to edit but at the same time i know people really like it when i do those ones where there's tons of updates people are like whoa mm. thanks for all the news <laughs> like it's a, it's, a, it's a lot but it's good and people like it so it's one of those things I think that you're better off to just, well, for me, sometimes I'm like, and sometimes I need to cut a few of these bodybuilding news stories away. And I feel bad because I'm like, oh, I like this guy. I want to put this, the updates in, but it is hard to yeah. fit so many in, especially now it's contest season. 
in the off season, it's like, yeah. give me the stories. Give me someone put an update on. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sweet. I can, I can talk about it. Talk about their potential in the next shows, what shows they're doing, find out, message them. Okay, cool. I've got that. But yeah, yeah, when it's, when it's contest season, like around now with how many good guys are com, you know, coming up to compete, it's like you are spoiled for bodybuilding stories at the moment. So people saying that, that nothing happens in bodybuilding, there's, I think there's a lot happening now. So yeah, sure. I mean, especially this year is so competitive that it's going to be a thing. I mean, I thought it was like, oh, the Olympia is going to be super exciting. But before that, you know, to, to, to get there, it's gonna, every show is going to be stacked and it's going to be fun. And <laughs> now there's more money. It's more, yeah. it is more yeah. exciting because guys oh, yeah. are go going into these shows. Well, we've got Dubai Pro, which is obviously $100,000 for first, huge, 380K that weekend across three divisions. Awesome, awesome. Um, and then you've got these other shows, the minimum is 15 now, and second place is nine. So now yeah. that the minimum in second place for any show is $9,000 compared to what was it, five in the past or? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Basically, first place was ten, so now you get almost a first place for second place, prize money wise. That's why a guy can go on a run, and if, even if he doesn't, just say he wins one show, gets two seconds, and that's the three shows he does. You got eighteen plus fifteen, so you got thirty three thousand dollars. When in the past that would be ten plus, you'd be about eighteen thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars. Big yeah, difference. You imagine you get like third at the Arnold Classic. It's like probably like seventy five thousand. You get Second at Dubai, maybe like fifty thousand or forty thousand, something like that. It's, it adds up quickly. <laughs> yeah, and, and you make a hundred, couple hundred k in a year for sure. And obviously that's before tax, but that's like any income. You know what I mean? So if you're making a hundred k a year, you, you know, yeah. it's just the fact that you tax some of it. But yeah, like you said, said um, Stan, you could have Raf that wins, uh, gets third in the Arnold. So is that seventy five? Definitely. I imagine that because, you know, 300, 150, 75, around that, I guess. Yeah. And next year, it will be at least 75 with it being 500,000 first. So just say 75, just say he wins the Arnold Brazil. I don't know how much that's paying, but I can't imagine it's super low. 100. I think it's, yeah. 200, yeah. Just, just say it's 100, 175, goes into the Olympia and places sixth. So just say whatever, I'm not sure what that pays, but just say it's $200,000 or maybe he does a couple more shows and, and wins and gets 230K. We're talking almost a quarter of a million just from contest earnings now. Compare that to the past, he would have had no hope of making that much with those same placings. So unless you're talking back with those post-Olympia shows are on, but then you had the top one of the top two guys or the top two guys, Phil and Kai going and doing them and you know wiping out yeah. the, the top prizes at those shows. So the, I just love the fact that there's more potential to make more money now in bodybuilding and it makes it more exciting in these smaller shows because there's more on the line. Because in the past, it's like, mm -hmm. The difference between second and third, people are like, eh, but second is considerably more than third now. So it really does matter. So uh, I'm glad, so glad to hear that the, the they went from 10 to 15 first prize, like a minimum, because that was, that had been stagnant for like 25 years, 30 years. Yeah. I think yeah. it's a, it's a, it's just for open bodybuilding. It's the um, corporate okay. sponsor, MPT 45 and Uprising Extract. Thanks to them. Wow. They're sponsoring the bodybuilding and increasing the price money yeah yeah mm -hmm. uh, they, they put up there's an extra 10k for every open show so i'm surprised wow. you didn't hear it ron it was um pretty big news no, i, I, I did i didn't look at yeah i think i was in turkey what happened <laughs> i yeah. didn't hear that they were that they were putting more money in those two companies you just mentioned but i didn't realize it was going to be for every single open show that's awesome yeah. man i mean uh, anything that can get these athletes paid paid more is, is great yeah Sure. Was it 31 open shows they said there were? That seems like no 20, 21, I believe. No, oh, 21, that's right. Yeah, 210k, ten thousand dollar total, I believe. Yeah, so because I, I, I was thinking that doesn't sound right because that's more than one every second weekend for a whole year. So I'm like, that's that's not that can't mm -hmm. be right. So yeah, it's 21. So you put in $2,100, which is huge. And it's, um, it's yeah, I don't know exactly how it works, but it's MIT 45, who's a huge um company make the same things as uprising extracts i can't remember what it's called now um there is they're, they're a company they're the same company basically from my understanding um, yeah the, the the same thing i'm not sure what's what if there's already two drink thing or it's both they, they're, they're the same um corporation are they they're, they're exactly the same yeah. corporation because i think they were doing it separately initially from what guy said and then i think 
now they've they've collaborated in that way because they realized they wanted to get into the market i think guy said of of fitness and and bodybuilding and they were like who are these guys uprising that are already already here so, um because i know i know guy said it was the same company he yeah like, i think yeah, i think it's sort of merged now yeah oh okay okay yeah but previously i think guy and his business partner or something like this were doing it together and then i think they realized you know a huge company like mid 45 that do it you know to it to a ton of people i, mean, I think got maybe a hundred couple hundred thousand followers um they, they obviously you know it's like it's like uh any industry if they see someone who's they, they want to get into that sector that that subculture of those sort of people that could be into this product they want to buy it out mm -hmm. you know what i mean but then they've obviously collaborated and um, I'm yeah. sure it's I'm sure it's all good for Guy and also I think it's Guy Sinino's birthday too so happy birthday to Guy and I'd actually love to get him on this podcast too because I, I like Guy and he's not afraid to sort of say <laughs> say what he thinks and stuff so but um, yeah not. they've done an awesome job <laughs> or, awesome awesome job putting more money into bodybuilding and the fact that I'm sure Guy had a part of pushing for this you know pushing yeah. for the prize money so um, shout out to them and there was another company as well oh. I don't know if it was Wolfpack or whatever that sponsored wellness the destroy each other, I remember. <laughs> I just you, know that, that? Um, that I didn't I don't sorry I didn't hear what you said but I was just saying uh, Tyler I, I know Tyler had the intention of increasing the price money he, he mentioned that like months before the the sponsorship so that was something they were actively working on I don't know if they were already in negotiation or what but but what, what were you oh, saying sorry I was saying someone did it for wellness as well I don't know if it, I don't oh, want yeah. to misquote Wolfpack. this Wolfpack, Wolfpack. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah okay yeah yeah Wolfpack seemed like a good company. They sponsor the, I think they sponsor the Olympia as well, and they, they put put a lot into bodybuilding. So, I'd actually, yeah. um, I, I'm I'm going to send them a message because all their stuff looks cool as well. So, I might try to hit them up mm -hmm. and see if they want to do anything with desktop bodybuilding. Because obviously, any company that wants to sponsor bodybuilding, you know, it's in the name. So, let's <laughs> see what we can do. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, the only other thing is I I didn't answer how I got into YouTube. I think I've answered it before, but pretty much I started doing it because I saw what like Louis Marco was doing how he's literally just sharing his screen and just talking bodybuilding. And I was like, oh, I reckon I could do that better. <laughs> like, like not as funny, not as funny, but I could make it like better. I could do it different not necessarily better, but yeah. I could share my screen, but have it in a more, a, a way that might get more clicks or whatever. But it was, it was sort of bubbling away for a while. I saw what Nick Strength and Power did, Louis Marco. And then I'm like, what Louis Marco does is super simple, like recording your voice while just recording your screen and then just putting it out compared to what, you know, video production and stuff. I'm like, that's easy. I'm like, I reckon I can, I can do it a little bit fancier and that'll be my point of difference. So yeah, I just got motivation from Nick Strength and Power and, and what Louis Marco did. Um, and then I was like, okay, I reckon I can do, do it my own way and started putting videos out. We're getting low views and then um, did a few videos and then, one took off and then the next video I put up that got like 20,000 views. I'm like, okay, this is a new thing now before I was getting like 400 views or however. Uh, and then yeah. it just, it just shot it up. And the algorithm used to be different back then too. So it's always forever changing. So it's like a, it's, it's an art of figuring it out sometimes, but uh, yeah. yeah, that's pretty much how I got started and went away from it for a little bit. Cause I got uh, what we call glandular fever and then, and then eventually came back to it. Well, I think it's called mono in America. Yeah, so man, that 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 is no joke. When you get it bad, I know people have varying degrees, but it actually, I think, bad. I believe it actually got into my uh, uh, kidneys or whatever. But I had ah. extreme itchiness, huge inflammation, like my inflammatory markers. They said, like, look, we're gonna have to do some sort of a, <laughs> a biopsy or something at this point because it is. And I wasn't training; I was literally just trying to rest and yeah, just inflammation through the roof. And yeah, mm. it is it is no joke, but uh. Anyway, guys, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Ron, give us a shout out. Uh, or give, give yourself a shout out <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let people know how they can find you on uh, IG and obviously YouTube channel as well. Yeah, it's all Ron Harris Muscle on IG, Ron Harris Muscle on YouTube. Yeah, trying to grow my channel, trying to trying to stay relevant and all that because uh, I've been doing this for a very long time, but I'm not done yet. Appreciate you having me. You know, big admirer you've you've done i've i've watched you grow this channel and from i don't know what's been four years five years so but man yeah, about it's, four, uh, four four yeah something like that yeah 
and I, and I also like to see the uh, the young generation. You know, you're the what are you like 30, 34, 35? 34, thirty four, thirty five, thirty four. Yeah, thirty four. I mean, I, I love I seeing think... knowing that the this there's a next generation of people who are going to carry on the journalism. Like, because I I admire the guys like Peter McGuff and 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 that generation of guys, and then I was the next generation. And, you know, you and there's even people younger than you that are that are killing it on YouTube and keeping the passion and drive alive for for Bible because, you know, this is a this is a sport. I love this sport. Always have always will. And anything anything to make it more popular and uh, and get the word out about it. it, it it's, it's 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 a beautiful thing. So keep yeah. doing what you're doing, Xavier. And something I, I realized as well, what was said on another YouTube channel, uh, I think it was another YouTube channel just recently. They said, what happens if all the YouTube channels go away? Someone said that. And they said, and what about if, uh, I think then I, maybe I started thinking about it or maybe I said it, I can't quite remember. But they said, what about if buyers and tries, all these other outlets on social media go away? Where does bodybuilding sit in terms of popularity, in terms of people getting the news and things like that? Because we don't have a, like the NBA, it's on TV. It has a huge social media page with tens or maybe even hundreds of millions of followers there's these outlets that you can always sort of go to but if these you know fan pages went away really the fans are, are the bodybuilding media in reality in a way well you can call us fans you can i mean people i think get offended when we call us not that i call myself a journalist really but that's that's essentially when when you look at the drop job description it is what it is like yeah. even if it is sort of something like that it is technically what it is i don't call myself that because i just don't want the blowback but but it <laughs> but it, it is uh it, it, without i think what obviously you've done uh ron in this industry without what you know flex back in the day has done as a magazine without what an extreme of power has done without what a lot of these you know entities have done in bodybuilding have really kept it going because and people don't even realize it. I think it just breathes by itself, but it's the the athletes. Without the athletes, it's dead. Without the coverage, it's dead. Without this, it's dead. So sometimes as much as some people don't like the drama, if it's <laughs> if it's reported in, if an NBA, top NBA player does something, it will be reported. It will be dug into. It will be even more brutal than bodybuilding. And it, it does suck. And I don't thrive on the drama. I think I like to cover it. To be honest, I don't even like doing a, dra a drama type video. But if you've got one guy talking about, well, I've never got on a podcast and it's smack talk or whatever, hey, then there's a rivalry and we can we can create something and we can create some excitement amongst the fans. And fans are always going to have an opinion one way or the other. And there's always going to be a strong opinion. So if you've got two guys that say something to each other, one of them is going to hate the other one. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, we don't really know you know, sort of what goes on behind the scenes and it's all a bit of fun, you know what I mean? So when we say this guy versus this guy, it's just a bit of fun. So um, like a Dexter Jackson versus a Hardy Chupin, you mm. know, watching this, Dexter could well be offended that, you know, I said that I think at the very best Hardy would win, but it's all a bit of fun. Honestly, they're both great champions in their own right and I think everyone sort of needs to remember that <laughs> um, through all this because... um I have, you know, I've spoken to uh, Samson Dowder in the past and he said, you know, getting, not winning a show, but it's a huge placing. Like when he plays, you know, top six in the Olympia and people have been like, oh, sorry, you know, and it's like, <laughs> I'm top six in the world. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you don't have to be sorry. <laughs> like, it's like one of those things. So when, sometimes when guys don't win, the fans, I think, so like, oh, that sucks. Like you suck if you're fifth. <laughs> it's like... No, you, you got it twisted. <laughs> like you don't get it. But, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you credit, Ron, as well, for what you've done in this industry. Okay. And, uh, Appreciate and it's it. uh, been awesome having you on once again. And Stan, as always, thank you. You absolute <laughs> nutcase, Stan Huberman. And we actually found out, Ron, we found out last episode, Stan is actually a white Nigerian. So he's part of a crew and he actually lived in Nigeria <laughs> wow. as a kid. Yeah. Really? <laughs> no yeah, way. I live in that Nigeria. Explains I that explains everything. <laughs> that, that's now I get it. So, yeah. he, he he drank the water. He drank the water on. That's all it really is required. I got yeah. the sun. I got the sun. Yeah. <laughs> take it, it the red light. Take, uh, something over there takes all the myostatin out of the human body. Yeah. 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 <laughs> imagine, but imagine if we found that out. If that was actually a thing, like drinking the water from Nigeria, there's some sort of thing, I and mean, you couldn't even I mean, export it. You had to drink it there. Andrew, Samson, Blessing, Quinton, 
Yeah. He's a good guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's something going on there. There's something going there's on. A, there. There's even more. There's there's even I think some guys in classic that are really good, and some other guys oh, yeah. um, that I've heard as well. And I'm like, oh, he's from Nigeria. Oh, he's from Nigeria. I don't, I don't know. It's like there's some other guys that are quite good that we sort of forget are Nigerian too. So it's yeah, it's it's unbelievable. Out of all the African countries too, it's just. Seriously. But I mean, there's a lot of good African bodybuilders from other countries around there, but just the percentage wise in Niger from Nigeria it's, is it's, just crazy. It's West Africa, like Ghana, where. Uh... Bonax from West Africa, yeah. very muscular, big frames. You look at the other side of the continent, Ethiopia, Somalia, not yeah. so much. You know, they're they're very slightly built, ectomorphic. Uh, so it's it's definitely different. I don't know, mus muscular mm -hmm. structures or cellular structures or something. Something's very different about that particular region of the continent. But what's mm -hmm. funny normally, like Nigerian people are more like shorter, very like like stocky. wide and thick. Yeah. yeah stocky but like but all these guys um blessing andrew quinton and samson they're all tall <laughs> yeah yeah sure. it's true yeah. yeah so don't drink the water from ethiopia but drink the water from nigeria so yeah. <laughs> got it <laughs> if you if you want to atrophy ethiopia that side of things but it, it is it is completely funny as well how one side of the country be one way. I'm like, I always wonder how that actually works ancestrally. Like, were there all these crazy animals on one side and in, in, in one type of animal where they had to fight them off, and then the other type where they just had to run for a long time to tire them out? I'm like, I don't know. There has to be something to do with that. So, but anyway, guys, thank you so much for doing this show once again for Stanimal, Stan Delonju, IFV Pro, and Ron Harris. Go check out his channel on YouTube and myself, Xavier Wills. We are. Out. Out. That was good. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Bodybuilding University. And if you did, give a video a thumbs up, smash that like button, and also subscribe and click the notification bell button. And that's particularly important because this is on a new channel compared to the original desktop bodybuilding channel. Now, both channels will still be running. The original channel will have more bodybuilding news, and this one will have the podcast and interviews. So make sure you subscribe, and if you're not subscribed to the original desktop bodybuilding channel, head over there and subscribe to that as well. Anyway, guys, that's it for this one. For all the guys at Bodybuilding University and myself, Xavier Wills, we are out.